On today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the longer LK4X 3D printer. I'm going to unbox it, assemble it, and examine some of its key features. We're going to find out, can this 3D printer stand out amongst the crowd of current offerings out there? But that's not it. I'm also going to be giving away this 3D printer. All the information is going to be towards the end after the technical info we go over. So stay tuned. And here we go. Folks, welcome to the channel. I am Leo of Prince Leo 3D. Thank you so much for joining us. And as I said earlier, today we're focusing on the longer LK4X 3D printer. If you're new to 3D printing, you may never have seen a printer that looks like this. But if you're a little familiar with 3D printing, maybe you have one printer already, you probably have come across a design just like this. If you're familiar with the Voxleb Aquila or the Ender 3 Pro, this design is basically a carbon copy of that. However, it does have a few features that some of those base models have omitted. And those features are really what I think are important to the longer LK4X. Because at first glance, this is not the most impressive printer out there, I will be honest. The specs of this printer are fairly mundane. This is a 220 by 220 by 250 millimeter build volume, which is kind of standard nowadays. This has a direct extruder right here, which means the cold end that pushes filament is above the hot end that melts filament. Above that is a filament runout sensor that determines if there's filament constantly going to your nozzle while you're printing. And behind that sits our spool. The build surface that comes equipped with this 3D printer is a PEI spring sheet, which is awesome. It's my preferred build surface. PEI is laid down in almost a powder coated texture on here. And that material loves filament to adhere to it. So you're gonna get great adhesion from things like PLA, PETG, and ABS. We'll talk about those a little further on. And what this spring sheet allows us to do is flex the build surface and our model pops off. The hot end is a standard MK8 hot end. I get into it further in the video, but really what it means for us in the short term, if we're going to print at temperatures 240 Celsius and above, we can run into issues. So ultimately, if you are thinking of purchasing this, you're gonna to need to factor that in. But most importantly, it has a bed probe, and this is great for beginners. Leveling our bed is not the easiest task, and if you're new to this hobby, it can take a little while until you really get it right. What this bed probe does is assist you in leveling your bed, not directly, but indirectly. You still need to manually level your bed. What the bed probe does is take height measurements from your bed. The 3D printer turns those measurements into a map of the actual curves and nooks of your bed surface. So while you're printing for the first 10 millimeters of a model or so, the nozzle will be moved closer or further away from the bed to account for any warpages or any bed leveling errors. This bed probe is going to help us get that last 10% when we can't quite level our bed enough or our bed is warped where even if we leveled it to the best degree we could, we still aren't getting those great first layers. That bed probe really shines there. That's why I think this is a really good option for those who are beginning to 3D print. I don't always like to talk about the prices of these printers because they're always fluctuating, but right about now, as of April of 2023, this is around a $300 printer. Most quote unquote entry level printers are around $180 to $200. Those printers are in the realm of Ender 3 Pros or Vox Lab Aquilas. They're great printers, they're reliable, and you'll get awesome prints. However, they require a decent amount of assembly, and then after they're assembled, they require some upgrades. This printer comes mostly pre-assembled. You should only have to take around 15 to 20 minutes to assemble it. And then all those upgrades that I recommend on those more inexpensive printers, they've already been performed on this printer, which is why I feel this is a better 3D printer for beginners. But after the time I've spent with this, I don't really have a lot of bad things to say. My two biggest concerns are the hot end is a stock MK8 hot end. I recommend replacing that. And this filament holder is absolute garbage. I don't mean to be that rude. Uh, I'm sure someone took a lot of time to engineer that, but the joints that need to be reinforced are less enforced, if that makes sense. And this filament spool really wobbles around a lot while you're printing. It just feels really weak, really unsecure. I don't know why they skimped on this filament spool holder, but they did. Not a game breaker, just kind of annoying. The hot end, however, is something I would look to replace if you were to purchase this. 
this 3D printer was given to me free of charge by zbanks.com. I wasn't paid for this. I wasn't told what to say. All my own thoughts, they don't get access to this video any earlier than anyone else does. I first started printing with this with the stock Marlin firmware. I then upgraded it to Clipper firmware. And to me, that really unlocks the potential of any 3D printer. And it really did so for this. I was able to perform unique calibrations like input shaping, which lessened vibrations, pressure advance, which gave me more stable extrusion. I joked around in the Discord about calling this the uh, Prusa MK4 killer. I usually never like to use terms like that. I don't like to compare printers in that kind of way. But I joked around because a lot of the features that are on that new Prusa machine are actually capable or actually available to us once I uploaded Clipper onto this. I had the input shaping I talked about, pressure advance. Our print speeds went way up. I printed, where is it? These Benchies were both printed at 160 millimeters per second and the other was printed at 200 millimeters per second. That's crazy on a complete stock machine and the prints were turning out really well. So that has been my experience with this printer. While I go through the unboxing and the assembly, I'm gonna talk about a few things that either caught my eye in a negative or positive light. So without further ado, we're gonna to get to the unboxing and assembly of this printer, the longer LK4X. And then after that, final thoughts and the giveaway. So let's go ahead and get this thing out of the box. This is all basic fare here. It was packed very nicely. All the tools and fashions we need to assemble this are in the box. It also comes with a spatula that you would usually get for a glass build plate to help get prints off the bed after they're completed. But we have a PEI coated one. We don't really need that spatula anymore, but here we have it. All the tools necessary to get this printer running. It even has the BL Touch probe and a really nice touch screen included. This printer comes semi pre-assembled. It should only be in two main parts, the upper extrusion and printhead and the lower extrusion with the bed attached. While the printer was disassembled, I wanted to take a quick look at the main board. When the electronics case comes off, we get a nice view of the main board. Everything looks tidy. Everything looks neat. That's a good thing. Another positive here was some of the connections weren't soldered ends. They were actually cables. That was really good to see on these larger voltage wires. Interesting inclusion also was this row of GPI opens. Not really sure what we can use that for yet, but it's something to keep in mind. Now we start by just mounting the upper and the lower parts of the pre-assembled printer. I'm using a carpenter square here to make sure everything is square as I tighten up the four screws that are going underneath the bottom extrusion to hold on the upper extrusion. You want to go through this the first time and get it semi-tight and then follow through one more time and tighten it up fully. Next is the filament sensor and mount and they get attached to the top rail. When you attach this filament sensor, you want to make sure that the arrow is pointing down towards the bed. That's the direction the filament's going to move. And then this filament holding mount. And to be honest, this is the cheapest part of this entire assembly. I'm going to print a replacement if I haven't already. And that's what your filament will look like once it's mounted, pass through that filament sensor. And next we're going to install our BL Touch probe. There's a wire coming off the printhead. Make sure to connect your probe first before installing. After it's connected, we're gonna fasten it to its mount, and then we fasten the mount to the printhead. And all these screws are provided for us. Before going any further in the unboxing, I wanted to remove the shroud and take a look at this hot end. The cold end extruder, which is what pulls the filament, is a BMG style clone. When I removed the extruder, I could see that there was a Bowden tube directing the filament path between the extruder and the hot end, and that was something I was gonna look into a little further. But first I wanted to open up our extruder and see exactly what the internals look like. And it's your standard BMG clone. This is a dual gear extruder, meaning there's two gears that are pushing and pulling the filament. And those gears are driven by a larger gear, which means this applies a gear ratio, which should provide more consistent extrusion. Then to remove the mounted fans and inspect the hot end. And it is a standard MK8 hot end, what you would see on any Ender 3 or Voxel Abiquila. The problem with this hot end is the Bowden tube runs all the way down to the nozzle. So whatever temperature the nozzle is, the Bowden tube is going to be. And at temperatures higher than 240 Celsius, we can run into issues. I was going to replace the heat break to fix this issue, but I didn't have one around. So I decided to replace the entire hot end. That requires me to remove the hot end from the carriage, then disconnect the heating cartridge and thermistor, which give heat and detect heat respectively. And then I can replace this with my all metal hot end, which basically means the Bowden tube will no longer be touching any part of the heat zone. I reinstall the heating cartridge and thermistor. I made sure to install that heat break between them and tighten it up. 
Then the heat sink goes on top, that gets tightened, and the hot end gets remounted onto the carriage plate. Because the Bowden tube's not going as low as it used to, I had to just remeasure it and adjust it, and then I lay the cold end extruder right on top. I remounted the fans and I tightened the extruder, but I want to leave the shroud off for now because there are some calibrations I'm going to perform that require it to be loose. Next is the screen wrapped in cellophane, and there is a huge sticker to remind us we need to set the voltage on our power supply. So let's do that right now. Power supply nestled under the bed. There's a gigantic sticker over the voltage selector, which I think makes it harder to see for whatever reason. After I scraped it away, I did select the proper voltage, and for me, that's 115. Very important step, though. Do not miss this. I then continued mounting my screen to the rail. After that, it was plugging everything in. Started with the back of the screen plug. I went to the back of the bed where the Y end stop and stepper are. Those were already plugged in for me. Then I went to the X axis, checked the same, and again, they were already plugged in. You have to make sure to plug in the Z stepper motor at the bottom of the rail. And then around front is the optical end stop switch. Now, if you aren't using the 3D touch, then you would need to plug this in. However, I doubt a lot of people are going to opt for this. I'm just showing you how to plug it in. In case you do need to use this somewhere down the line, there's not a lot of room to get the plug in there, so you'll need to remove it off the extrusion, plug it in, and then remount it. Then behind the bed, we plug in that large connector to the back of the bed. And make sure that your filament sensor is also plugged in. For whatever reason, mine had the E marking on it, which usually stands for extruder. And then they give you some nice extrusion caps for the filament wire because it's dangling all the way down from the top to the bottom of the electronics box. So you can hide the wire in the channel of the extrusion by just clicking in the supplied extrusion caps. Then finally, we clip away the two zip ties holding our print head and then our print bed. And before I power this on, I want to just double check the eccentric nuts on our printer. Very important aspect. I start with the one on the bottom of my print head. And then I move to the eccentric nuts along the inner Z axis. And then finally, the two that are under my bed, and those are located on the side of the optical switch. That's all the calibrations we can do while the printer's powered down. So now let's power it on and continue. Before printing, the first calibration we're going to perform is an E-step calibration. And that calibration ensures our extruder is pushing out the exact amount of filament we're asking it to. Now, with some direct extruders, this calibration can be a little tricky because you may have to run the filament through the nozzle due to how the cold end and the hot end are mounted. However, with this setup, it wasn't all that hard. I unmounted the extruder, I remounted it one screw hole higher, and then I tilted it. This allowed me to only feed filament through my extruder which is what we're measuring with this calibration. Now, in order to extrude, we need to bring the temperature up on the hot end. I brought it to 200 degrees Celsius. You can then go to the move menu to find your extruder, which marked E, and we can move 100 millimeters through that extruder. After my first attempt at extruding 100 millimeters, my extruder was over extruding. I extruded 104 millimeters. So I needed to do a little bit of math and recalculate my e-steps and that requires me to get my current e-step value however when navigating through the menus i could not find anywhere where it was stored but hope was not lost i was able to connect my computer to my 3d printer and using software called Pronterface, which is free i was able to communicate with it using the terminal that Pronterface offers i was able to read my current e-steps calculate my new e-steps and then apply them and it worked like a charm after my second attempt at the calibration I asked for 100 millimeters of filament, and that's what I got. While I still had Pronterface open, though, there was two more calibrations I wanted to do, and they are temperature calibrations. I PID calibrated the temperature for the hot end, and then I did it for the bed. And those calibrations help our 3D printer maintain temperatures more consistently over a longer period of time. I made sure to save all that data, and then I could disconnect from Pronterface. After the E-step calibration, I could put the extruder back into its location. Make sure those wires are tucked around underneath it and two screws to snug it up.
And because I put a new extruder on, I have to do this, but I normally do this anyway, and that is to heat tighten our nozzle. And in order to access the nozzle, I have to remove this one parts cooling fan. And then I can get a wrench in there to stabilize the heating block and the nozzle. And whenever I am touching this nozzle, whenever I make sure the power to the printer is off, if you accidentally touch one of the wires, the thermistor wire going into the heating block, you could short out your board. I power on my machine, raise the heat on the nozzle, power it off, and then snug up the nozzle ever so tightly. This is a brass nozzle. If you use too much force, it is going to crack off. So I'm very gentle. I'm only moving this a minor amount. Now, if you're doing this, remember, put on that silicone sock. I then re-secure the parts cooling fan, and then the whole fan shroud gets re-secured, and it's very simple. It's only three screws. And then take a look at the belts. We want them to be snappy, not sagging. Longer has provided the belt tension on both the X and the Y axis to tighten these up. Here's a screen, it's a touch screen, and all the different menus are just as you would assume. The move menu can move the print head around as well as the different axes. File menu is where any of your print files would be located. The tune menu allows you to bring the temperatures up and down, adjust speeds, and even adjust your Z offset. This menu will let you preheat your nozzle and bed to store temperatures for PLA or ABS, for instance, as well as unloading and loading of filament. And finally, we have the leveling menu, which lets us level our bed manually, as well as use the automatic BL Touch Pro. Now, starting with manual leveling, we have five different quadrants that the nozzle will move to so we can level, or more appropriately named, tram our bed. I'm going to start with the first quadrant. Now, on the first quadrant, for some reason, it started about five millimeters too high above the bed, maybe even 10. I moved to the second quadrant, and it homed itself perfectly. So I went back to the first. I use a post-it note as my feeler gauge. I run it between the nozzle and the bed, and then I move the adjustment knob to get some tension on it. I want this tension to be equal on all points. When I'm finished with the first zone, I move to the second quadrant, and I continue to do this from each quadrant except the fifth. I will never adjust the fifth quadrant, which is the center of the bed, because we really don't have control over that. We have control over the corners with these knobs, but not the center of the bed. So we just have to hope this bed is relatively flat and there's no warpage. Don't skimp on this. Take your time. Go through this a number of rounds until you get it right. After you get the bed level, we can start creating a mesh with our BL Touch probe. The first step here is to adjust the Z offset, and this is identical to what we did while we level the bed. Use the same feeler gauge you use while you level the bed, but now you're going to use the screen to lower the nozzle to the bed to create that same tension. This is the adjustment that brings our nozzle closer to the bed for our first layers. After you save that data, the BL Touch will begin to probe the bed in 16 locations, and it's collecting height information. This will create a virtual topography of our bed, and that information will be used during our first 10 layers or so of printing to adjust the nozzle to the actual contours of our bed. And finally, we need to wash our PEI bed. We don't know where it's been, and you're gonna have to do this from time to time anyway. Some dishwashing soap and running water is all we'll need, and then we can jump over to our slicer and set up our first print. Now, before we get started with our first print, we need to set up our slicer, and I'm using Ultimaker Cura. Now, in my version of Cura, there is no option for the LK4X. There is, however, an LK4 Pro. Now, the differences between these machines is minimal, and the ones that are there, we're going to make changes to. So I selected the LK4 Pro. Once selected, I entered the machine settings tab. There, I can edit the start code to add key features, namely our BL Touch Probe usability. We need to enter a line to use our probe, and we have two options. The line M420S1 will call upon a saved mesh before we start printing our model. The other option is the line G29, which before our model starts printing, probes the bed and uses the mesh data gathered while we're printing. Now we just created the mesh in the previous step, so I wanna use that mesh. I'm gonna use M420S1. You don't wanna use both of these, so I get rid of G29 and make sure that these are after any calls to G28. The other adjustment I need to make is to the retraction distance. This is a direct extruder printer, meaning the cold end and hot end are on top of each other. The retractions for such a printer should be very small. In our slicer, the stock retraction is five millimeters. We're gonna lower this to 0.5 millimeters. That's half a millimeter in length. Don't worry, our extruder should be able to handle that. However, if you run into retraction issues with this length, you can always perform some tests and then readjust it. This, however, worked fine for me throughout all my printing. After that, you can make any normal adjustments 
you normally would add to your profiles. I like to add in some Z hop. I'll turn on coasting and things of that nature. And now for the first print. And if you watched any of my videos, when I have a new printer, I generally will print five squares that are a single layer height high scattered around the bed. I use the skirt to check Z offset and I use the squares to check how well my mesh is being applied. Once that's set up, we can slice, export, and begin our print. Our print starts and I run into an issue immediately. I'm not extruding filament. I do a quick diagnosis and I realize I didn't load filament. All right, let's forget this ever happened. I load some filament and I start to print again. And this time we are blazing. I'm rolling my finger over the printed skirt to check for adhesion. If the skirt pulls off, I need to lower my Z offset. The cubes that get printed are going to represent how well my bed mesh is being applied. I want them all to look uniform and these printed wonderfully. That means all my probe values are working as intended. And now I can move on to printing a model. And my first one is an XYZ calibration cube. This is a simple 20 by 20 by 20 millimeter cube that can show you how well your printer is operating. And the longer did a great job with this. The next print I tried was a calibration Charlie. And this time I wanted to check my filament runout sensor. I clipped my filament while I was printing and the runout sensor triggered like it should. It parked the nozzle in the corner of the bed. It kept the bed heated and it allowed me time to reinsert new filament. Afterwards, it purged filament and began to print again right where it left off. No layer skipping whatsoever. And this two color calibration Charlie finished up marvelously. For my next print, I wanted to try a different filament type and I chose PETG. This is a higher temperature filament, so it's important that we did our hot end swap. And this can be a difficult filament to print. Adhesion isn't necessarily an issue, especially with our PEI bed, but stringing can be an issue. Overall, the longer printed this really nicely. The stringing you see is really just slicer specific, and I can tweak various aspects like retraction and temperature to counteract that stringing. After PETG, I wanted to try flexible filaments, TPU. This was some generic TPU I had laying around, and I'm printing this calibration rabbit, and it turned out really nicely. Just like the last print, you'll see there is some stringing present. But again, that is due to the profile I'm using on my slicer, and some further tuning can definitely take that away. Print after print, they all came out well. This next one was a TPU grill that I practically maxed out the build volume for. I was printing in silk PLAs. Everything turned out so well. I was really happy with how this was printing. After taking it through its paces with the stock Marlin firmware, I wanted to upgrade it with Clipper firmware. I had a Raspberry Pi 3 that was laying around that already had Clipper installed. So getting this running was as simple as using the Pi to create a Clipper firmware file that I could then transfer to an SD card and upload to our 3D printer. It was so simple. Longer was nice enough to create a configuration file all ready for us to use in Clipper. The configuration file is what Clipper uses to operate your 3D printer. Now, it's a vanilla stock profile, so I had to do a little bit of tuning on it, but as a base configuration, it worked really well. And once we get on Clipper, you can see the benefits it affords us. We now have macros that we can use at the press of a button to do some of those tunings, like PID tuning that we did earlier. We can use built-in commands like screw tilt adjust, which takes measurements over the four bed screws and tells us how to turn the leveling knobs to properly level our bed. It makes bed leveling so simple. After its simple edit, I changed the probing grid from 4x4 to 5x5. It increases the amount of probing points and should get us a more accurate mesh. And Clip also allows us a bed visualizer. It shows us what the mesh looks like, and we can compare it to a flat surface to see how warped our bed may be.
We also get the ability to use an adaptive mesh, which only probes the area that our print is going to be over. So that means I get those 25 probing points over only the area I'm going to print. We also get webcam functionality, so I can watch my printer from anywhere. We don't have to use the SD card anymore. We can now upload prints with a click of a button. This really turns this printer on to the next level. Just like I started before, I start with a calibration cube. And you'll notice from the comparison side by side, things aren't quite right. And this is normal. The top corners here are a little rounded on my clipper cube. And the top sections are a little pushed in on the same clipper cube. And that's all rectified by some simple calibrations. I perform a pressure advanced calibration. Pressure advanced makes sure we're pushing the right amount of filament out of our nozzle. And then directly after, input shaping calibrations. And input shaping helps to curtail vibrations that are being transferred to a model while printing. I print another cube, and this time it comes out perfect. And here's the best part. It's printing at nearly double the speed. After the cube finishes, I want to check how my filament sensor worked with Clipper. And it worked just as well. And this is another boon of Clipper. With Marlin, we had to hope the firmware had the right operation for the filament runout sensor the first time. Otherwise, we have to compile brand new firmware. With Clipper, all we need to do is continually tweak the filament runout code to get our desired result. It's quick, it's easy, and it's responsive. This is a four filament swap total model, and this bowling pin was an absolute strike. Then I realized the only material I hadn't printed in that I wanted to was ABS. So I started on that. Now this again is a high temperature filament. So if you are thinking about printing this material, I definitely recommend that all metal hot end. I thought this was an unsupported crab model, but unfortunately it did need a little bit of support. So you might see some stragglers here and there while it's printing. But other than that, this printed just as expected. ABS can be difficult to print, but this had no problems with it. It adhered well, it removed easily, and it turned out pretty nice. As you can see, this was a pretty consistent print. This printer gave me everything I asked of. So at this point, I wanted to push it a little further. I upped the speeds, I upped the accelerations, and I wanted to try and print a Benchy at around 180 millimeters per second. And as you can see, this thing is absolutely flying. And it printed this really well for how fast it was going. And a lot of that is due to the cooling. This has those dual parts cooling fans, which is going to help, especially when we are printing at high speeds. While I wouldn't print at this speed all the time, it was really remarkable to see the out-of-the-box quality I was able to get at these high speeds and these high accelerations. As a final wrap-up, this printer worked really well for me, both on Marlin and on Clipper. I was happy with all the models it produced, and this printer gave me confidence that I could hit the print button and just walk away and know the model would be completed. And there you have it. I hope you like watching this printer as much as I like using it, assembling it, and then diving into it. It was a really nice printer for me. If you skip to just this part of the video without watching it in its entirety to find out the giveaway, well, you missed the secret code I talked about. You got to go back and watch. I'm joking. There was no secret code. You could, of course, have skipped to this. I don't care. I just want this to go to a good home. But thank you if you did watch the full video. So now, the giveaway, right? I teased this long enough. Very simple. There are some stipulations, though. The one is you need to be within the United States. I apologize. I know these videos go out worldwide, but right now I'm shipping this myself, paying all the costs. I don't do a lot of international shipping, so I don't know what the cost is going to be, and I don't want to get hammered with any prices. I'm going to get better at it, I promise. But right now, this is U.S.-based only. So how do I sign up? You need to be a subscriber to this channel, and then you need to join the Prince Leo 3D Discord. There is a link in the description to join the Discord. Once you're on, there is a giveaways tab. Enter that tab, find this giveaway, it should probably be the only one there at the time, and join it. It's that simple. In about two weeks from the publication of this video, I'm going to draw a winner, contact them, get some information, and then this printer will be out the door and hopefully on its way to you. I only had this printer for about four weeks, can I get to everything? Probably not. This might have some sort of weird peccadillo, some breakdown here or there. 
It's been fine for me though. But if it does, or if you have this printer and you have questions, leave them in the comments below. I answer every comment unless for some reason YouTube forgets to notify me, but I answer them all. Join the Discord. We talk every day and we're not just talking 3D printing, we talk everything. But it's really informative in there. Everyone is so smart. Everyone is so kind. So if you have questions, please join. I thank everyone that contributes there. We have such a solid core group of people that are just so, so nice and we share so much from all different time zones. And I thank you all for helping out and for being a part of it. We're gonna have more giveaways, I promise. The next two videos, I have a Minton Beagle Cam somewhere lurking in the realms. That's gonna get reviewed, that's gonna get given away. But we have other videos. I have a Pressure Advance video coming up for Clipper. I have a Clack Ender Probe video, another Kevin AKA production coming up for the Ender and Voxelab printers that I have sitting around here. So there's plenty more going on. And until next time, as always, boys, girls, everybody else, keep on printing.